Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, Carl's intro was great. Uh, hopefully, I can top that level of enthusiasm. But uh, what we want to talk about today is really going to be a blend of functional and then pretty deep into the technical, talking about how Amazon recognition really helped us to power creative asset production, analysis, and optimization. So three things we're going to cover. We're going to start off by talking about creative data, uh, which for some of you in this room will be a new concept. Um, then we want to talk about specifically how we're leveraging Amazon recognition. We're going to go into a lot of detail. We're going to show you about some challenges we had and how we worked through them. And then finally, I think the part that we're most excited about is to really dive uh, deep into the technology we built. We're going to show you a demo, and we're going to show you how our clients are using the tool. Um, and the reason why I think that's so interesting is James and I, uh, my co-presenter, we were looking back at uh, last year at this time. Uh, so November 29th is when we had in our notes when Amazon recognition for video was launched. So everything that you're going to see is something that's been developed built and adopted by clients since then. So for those of you who have come from big companies where work really slowly, that in less than a year we've been able to build something that's had wide adoption by clients is for us pretty exciting. So let's dive right into it. For, so for those of you who are not familiar with VidMob, we are a creative technology platform. And what we do is we connect brands uh, with a global network of talent. Uh, so that can be anything from video editors or uh, graphic designers, motion graphics artists, uh, to produce, uh, analyze, and optimize uh, video assets. And what's so interesting and so timely, I think, for Amazon recognition is that we've really entered this new world of marketing. Now, I know if you go to lots of these presentations, it feels like there's always a slide that says we've entered a new world of marketing. But it really is true, especially in the case if you sit at a big brand. Right? Everything has changed. So it used to be the case with advertising that you just designed for TV. One format, it was either 15 seconds or 30 seconds. But it's all changed. Platforms are expanding, and you need to build for each specific platform. So what you see in the background is all of the different formats. And with each of these formats, there's different specs and there's different best practices. For just social alone, there's over 50 different formats. Uh, and marketers uh, have a lot of data to understand these formats, but it's not actionable. right? Data's everywhere, but they don't know what to do with it. And the shelf life for any asset is shrinking. So for those of you who uh, were children of the 80s or the 90s, you can remember that a TV ad could run for a season. right? It can even run for a few weeks. That is no longer the case with social video. You've got five, seven, maybe 10 days. And after that, your ad is decayed. Your audience doesn't want to see it anymore. And it's incumbent upon you as a marketer to produce something new. And so the totality of all of these changes, I think, kind of feels like a traffic circle, right? It feels terrifying. It feels frustrating. It feels like the rules are always changing and that you just don't know what to do. And I think that's important because that's the genesis, fundamentally, of this product. And we knew that it felt like uh, a traffic circle for our marketers. And I want to pause on this because this is really the identification of the problem. So this time last year, even though we could build assets, the fundamental challenge is that marketers didn't know what to build. And when the ads didn't perform well in market, they didn't really know why. And so they would say things like, we know it works, uh, but we don't know why it works, or how do we strike this balance? We hear no text, text, logo in the first two seconds, not. And then finally, what everyone's always said, which is do people, babies, and puppies always work, right? There was these basic questions. Uh, I'm not going to answer that one today, but you could uh, use the product and find out. Um, so ultimately, all of these challenges and this frustration really meant that the way that we created ads needed to fundamentally change. And creative needed to change to something that was scalable, that could account for this shorter uh, lifetime. Measurable, but not just measurable, but fundamentally actionable, that you could have an insight and that you could pivot and do something with it to improve the effectiveness and the ROI of that which you were creating. So enter this idea of creative data. Um, and for that, I want to pass it over to James, who will talk about how AI has really become that new data source. James? Thanks, Jolene. Good morning, everybody. So as we started to tackle these problems and the marketplace challenges, we really needed to come up with a new way to populate this creative data. And AI is becoming the main data source for how we do that. And specifically, recognition is one of the tools we use through Amazon to help populate this data source. 
So today, I'm going to really walk you through how we're using recognition through our media processing pipeline to extract the labels and creative attributes and apply that to um, actionable data that our creators and marketers can use to um, create better video. Before I get started, how many people are experimenting or currently using recognition in their applications today? Good. So let me walk you through what recognition is for those of you that haven't used the service yet. So recognition started out um, as an image analysis service where you could submit an image to recognition and get back the object, scenes, facial analysis for anybody that was in that image, face and celebrity de uh, recognition, and you could also can also use it for moderation for unsafe image detection and also use it to extract text from um, any uh, from those images. As Julian mentioned, late last year, Amazon rolled out recognition for video, which allowed you to get all the same content or attributes from your video media as you were getting from your image media. But because we're now dealing with that, those attributes that span time, you can also look at objects that may indicate activity. So with an image, if you had a cup of coffee, somebody holding a cup of coffee in an image, you may not know that that person's actually doing something, so you would just get back cup. But in a video, you, we would see that that person is actually drinking the cup of coffee, and with video recognition, we can get the activity of drinking back as a label, which is a great feature. And then additionally, you can stream your live video feeds to recognition. If you use Kinesis Video Stream, you can pass that in and get um, all these labels back in real time. So how does this help us? So as Jolene mentioned, there's a lot of these unanswered questions of, of what is it that is making my creative performing? And historically, people have just defaulted to how does creative A compare to creative B? And if we've wanted to look at the details of those creative, we would hire people to watch videos or look at images and manually catalog what they're seeing. And that was very time intensive. Arguably, it got worse over time as people got bored and the things that they were interpreting um, may not be in line or consistent with the results that you were looking for. And so recognition has really helped us automate and scale that process by allowing us to not process tens or hundreds of images a week, but scale that up to thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of media throughout our platform. And with that, we've been able to build our Agile Creative Studio, which is really combining these AI, machine learning, computer vision services with the data coming from our social platforms with the creative talent that we have on our platform to make this data actionable. And so today I'm gonna to walk you through the recognition side of that and how we've, we've used recognition to extract that data to be used as part of our, our platform. So with recognition, we use it to de deconstruct our videos so that we can pull out the components that will feed into our application. So we use it to identify people, key visuals. We use uh, the image recognition to pull out text, branding and logo placement. And we'll use other Amazon machine learning services to identify sentiment. Um, we have production characteristics as part of our production flow that we may use as, as part of our process as well. So starting at the very top, we love Amazon and everything we've been able to do, um, we rely heavily on Amazon Web Services. And this gives us the opportunity to focus on developing the solutions for our clients without having to worry about building the underlying infrastructure. And with that, we have a almost infinitely scalable media and data processing pipeline. So we're, we don't, we're not looking to process one, two, three pieces of content a day, we are processing thousands of files a day through our platform. And we do that by building on Amazon services. So storage, obviously we're storing a lot of media. S3 is perfect for this. Our applications database is run on Amazon Aurora. We use Redshift for all the performance data that we're ingesting in from the social platforms where we can easily query billions of rows of data in real time. And we use Amazon Elastic File System as part of our media processing pipeline. Obviously, machine learning services are an important part of our stack. 
recognition as we're talking about today, Comprehend, SageMaker for training models and deploying models within our environment, and Transcribe for turning audio into text data that we can use as part of our application. And then we tie all these services together with Amazon's compute and amp application integration services. So EC2 and Elastic Beanstalk to actually deploy our applications. Uh, we use Lambda and Step Functions to actually control our machine learning process, and I'm gonna do a deeper dive there shortly. And SQS services for um, inserting messages for processing our media. So let's talk about our machine learning pipeline now. So the core of how we process media through our platform is based on Amazon's Step Function service. And if you're not familiar with Step Functions, uh, their service, it is the way to run various Lambda functions in an order to accomplish a task. And why we use this for recognition is that um, if you're processing a single image through recognition um, and using Lambda, Lambda has a certain timeout period that uh, the function will end in even if you triggered a uh, recognition service and it doesn't complete. What step functions allow you to do is build in wait times and re-trigger a Lambda function so longer running processes like for video recognition um, you can complete and manage through um, step functions. So before you can trigger a step function, you need to have a Lambda function that actually initiates that. And if you're not familiar with Lambda, Lambda functions get triggered in a variety of different ways. We use SQS queue, um, where we insert a media record into SQS, which triggers that Lambda function. You could use S3, an object being put into an S3 bucket, to trigger the Lambda function. You could use SNS to trigger that Lambda function. But the key point is that you need this Lambda function to initiate the first function within your step function for processing a media through recognition. And for us, our first step is start recognition. So you're gonna see we have recognition with a C and not with a K at this point because we're using a lot of different services to extract creative attributes. Um, one of them is recognition with a K. And then if we have audio that we need to extract, we'll kick off ECS to extract the audio and send that to transcribe so we can turn that audio into text. Once we kick off all the various processes that we are looking to run for this piece of media, we move to the next step in our step function. And this is, again, another Lambda function that really its purpose is to set the state of our step function, whether it's currently in progress or it's complete. And it does this by going out to our database and saying, for all the processes that I've kicked off, what is their status? And if one or more is in progress, then we just loop back around, we'll wait a little bit of time, and then we'll run the update status Lambda function again. And so as the various services that we've kicked off complete, we write them to an SS SNS topic, which, as I mentioned, can trigger a Lambda function. And as you might expect, this Lambda function updates the database and indicates for each process that has completed that it is done. And it will also dump all the raw data that we get back from the various services into an S3 bucket that we can use for processing later. At that point, the Update status check will verify that all, that everything is complete, and we'll move to the final step in our step function, which is processing the response. And at this point, we're gonna transform the data um, for use in our application. We may dump the tag data into Elasticsearch so we can query it easily. Or if we get, um, when we have a piece of media that we've identified certain objects in it, like a person, we may write that media back into our initial SQS queue so that we can process it again. And one of the reasons why we do that is recognition has a lot of different endpoints that you can use to extract labels. One of them is, is label detection. And for us, when we pass that, we might get back a person. And as I mentioned, with both image and video, person tracking, face detection are separate endpoints, and you may not want to incur those costs if there are no people in your media. So this is why we would repeat the process again when we get back label of person. So let's look at a little bit of code here to show that in, as an example. So that initial Lambda function that I was showing you, which is triggered by the SQS message, loads in the message with, for us, it's a media ID, um, which is how we track things in our platform, and optionally we may pass an API type. And 
that starts the start step function, which triggers the start recognition with a C lambda function, which looks something like this. And so if it's the first time we're seeing a piece of media, we have no API type, so we'll pass it through and start label detection for recognition. Once that entire cycle completes and we get back a label of person, we'll insert the SQS message again, run through these functions, but the second time through with an API type of person, we'll kick off face tracking and person tracking um, for that piece of media. So what does this, what does recognition response data look like? So here's a asset that we created in our platform. And here's the recognition response data streaming by. So if we look at this data a little bit, we can see that for each timestamp, there is a label which contains confidence and the name of that label. And if we look how recognition groups labels, we see a pattern here. And so recognition pretty consistently returns data grouped in 200 millisecond increments, and which is about five frames per second, depending on the media that you've uploaded. And so this is something that just to be aware of as you're processing the response data that you can expect um, groupings like that. So if we pair up those timestamps with the frames in our video, we get this. And then if we compare that to the recognition response data we got, we see this. So you may notice something here, that there's a hole in the data between 400 and 1200 for the object snowboard. So why do I bring this up? For our application, it's, there are certain use cases where it's important where we visualize an object that, that spans time. And there are cases where recognition might not return a label for an object even though it's there. So why does this happen? Well, recognition by default has a 50% threshold for confidence, which, you, um, which is the default. And so if the snowboard in frame 800 milliseconds and 1,000 milliseconds fell be below that threshold, it may not come back. You also may set the threshold, confidence threshold to 75%. And so if it came back at 61%, you would not see that. It may be important to you, it may not, depending on your application, but it's just something to be aware of as you're processing the data and figuring out what to do with it. And one last thing that I'll cover in terms of fun things that we had to do and solve with recognition is using face data, particularly gaze direction, and translating pose into direction that people could actually consume instead of looking at um, values that come back for pose. So this is Joe Monte. He's one of our senior software engineers, and he heads up our data product. And he wrote a little application to visualize how recognition data comes back for face, particularly pose, so he could understand how the roll, pitch, and yaw values translated into left, right, up, and down. And so here's a little bit of code how that logic might look, so you could translate that data into something that's usable within your application. So using recognition is a ton of fun. Um, it's a blast to upload images or videos of yourself and see what comes back, or whatever application you're writing. But that data really is only useful if you can use it to do something else. And really what we have focused on, what Amazon services has allowed us to focus on is quickly generating that data and allowing us to build tools and services so our clients can take action on that data. And so by the, all these creative attributes that we've extracted from recognition and other machine learning services, we're able to identify key visuals, whether scenes are cluttered, what the rate of speech is for audio in a asset, and combine that with performance data coming from the various platforms. And once we combine those two, we give marketers and creators insights into what within the media is actually helping to drive performance, instead of just defaulting to, is Creative A performing better than Creative B, which isn't the whole story. And this has allowed us to create tools which our clients use to actually answer all the questions that Jolene was um, mentioning. And so instead of talking about our tool, we're actually going to run through a demo and show you how we've taken this data and put it into practice for our application. Great. 
Okay, give us a second to switch screens. Uh, what you're gonna see is what we've built uh, since last year at this time. So as we mentioned before, we have integrations with all of the major social platforms. And what that allows us to do uh, in a very quick manner is to be able to pull down and analyze everything that they've run over the course of a year, three years, five years. And that's what you're seeing here. So the first thing you're seeing is just all of the assets uh, that uh, live in their social account and then the KPIs of interest to them. And then if we click on any one of these, we start to see all of the detail that recognition returns. So we're gonna play this as a video in a minute, but what we wanna do now is really show you, this is really the recognition labels brought to life. So I wanna orient you to the things that you're seeing on the screen. So if you look up in the uh, upper quadrant there, uh, you'll see the video that's playing. Uh, and we pulled the video down and we run the analysis. Yeah, so um, if we went back and looked quickly at this view, there are several assets here, and if we change back and a client wanted to look at all assets that they've run on Facebook over the last year or two years, we can ingest that video, download it to our platform, and run it through the machine learning process in, in minutes, right? And this process would have taken weeks, if not months, to do manually. And the output of that is the ability to have tag data that's associated with, with that video that we can make available to the client in near real time. So if you see above that, what you'll see is a drop off rate. Uh, what we know with social video is that in general, there's a trend towards uh, the video starts playing and audiences may leave, but we don't know why necessarily. So what we see up there is the drop off rate for a particular video and how it compares to an account average. But what we really care about is what is happening in those one or two seconds before audiences are either dropping off or staying. What are uh, the different characteristics of the ad? And so what we wanna start by showing you uh, is the speech and text characteristics. So you'll see there's four, uh, four fields up here. Um, and some of those are about what's spoken and others of those are about the language that is either overlaid or naturally occurring in the ad. So the first field you'll see is speech words per second. And from a research question, what we're interested in there is uh, the difference of someone talking very slowly, maybe too slowly, or someone talking too fast that it's either impossible to understand, annoying, irritating, or drives someone away. And James, you wanna talk a little bit more about how we get that? Sure. So the way we extract the speech words per second is by using transcribe. So we extract the audio from any video assets that are uploaded to our platform run it through transcribe, and get that text data back by time. And then we can do this analysis where we show words per second that are being smoke, spoken in the video um, and illustrate it as bar height as along the timeline in this view. Then beneath that, you'll see text words per second. So as James mentioned, uh, we get both the overlaid text that can be anything from a text card to a key message that's emblazoned, but also something as small as like the uh, name of a brand on a cereal box, right? Or even something like a, the car, right? The name of the brand of a car on a car. Uh, we pick all of that up. And what we're interested in there, again, is the same thing. Is this ad bombarding someone with text or not? And then just beneath that, and then James will sort of tell you about how we get that, is what is, if we combine speech and text, what is ultimately that one word that this advertisement is conveying to its audience? Yeah, so the, the text, particularly in video, is an interesting um, problem for us to solve, um, even with recognition. So recognition images, images allows you to do text extraction. Currently, video doesn't support that. It is coming from what we understand, but so today we actually have to extract frames from our video and pass it through Amazon's image recognition to get the text data. It seems like a, a extra step that might be uh, a, an extra burden, but we've actually tested a lot of different text extraction computer vision services and Amazon's is by far the best that we've had. We deal with video game publishers and if you've seen fonts for video games, they're all over the place and the image recognition through Amazon almost always picks up the text correctly. So um, if you need to extract text from your video, highly recommend um, extracting those frames and passing it through images, image recognition. 
So next we want to talk about people. So uh, another amazing thing is brands spend tons of money on talent. But if you ask them uh, which talent is most effective, right, which drives audience attention, it's often the case that they just don't know, right? Because they have no way to be able to get that granularity uh, by assets. So the next thing we're able to do is to identify really at a frame by frame level all of the talent in the particular ad. That talent can be big talent, right? Think Tom Cruise or some massive movie star, but we're also picking up uh, athletes as well as smaller commercial actors. And the bubbles you see associated with that are the specific frames of the asset that they're in. Yeah, so we are using celebrity detection service through Amazon to pull this data. And as, as I mentioned, this is a case where we're representing the amount of time that a particular label or celebrity is on screen. And when we had to necessarily fill in gaps, this is one of the reasons why we would fill in the gap, because we want to be as accurate as possible of how long that person or thing is, appears on the screen. So the next thing we're able to see is objects. And objects is really interesting because it's broader than what you think it is, right? So object can be something as small as thinking about the product that's advertised. If my product is a mobile phone, can I detect the mobile phone and where specifically it's present? But it's also broader than that. It also gives us things like the context. So think about hospitality for a second, right? We know that an ad that has a pool in the background versus a cityscape in the background versus a hotel lobby in the background is going to work differently with different audiences, but unless there was someone manually coding those particular assets, you'd never know that. What objects allows us to do is pick up every object that's within the asset, as well as any uh, background or backdrop as well. And so, as I mentioned, this is where we start with every new piece of media that enters our platform is this label detection, which gives us the person so that we can then run celebrity recognition or face tracking um, as part of that process, and also gives us all the other fun labels of all the things that are within a asset. Finally, last thing is emotions. So if we think about an advertisement, let's take something like life insurance, for example, right? It is not always the case that a super happy, full expression smile is most effective, right? In fact, there could be some industries where it's actually completely ineffective. That's what we see in our data, right? So we want to be able to pick up the sentiment um, of all of the key actors uh, that are within the asset and understand what are those uh, sentiments in the first few frames that really are most effective at retaining an audience. I think what's particularly interesting, which will, James will talk about in a second, is we get sentiment, but it's not necessarily binary. We're also able to see the gradations in that sentiment. So going back to my life insurance example, maybe if a smile is appropriate, it's not a huge full smile, right? It's a partial smile. We want to be able to use recognition to get those type of nuances. Yeah, so one of the ways that we've used confidence value that comes back in recognition is to determine how much of a smile is that, right? And so if recognition may not be 100% confident that smile, maybe it's a weak smile. And so we've used confidence value that comes back from recognition to uh, draw the bar graphs as part of the timeline to indicate really how how sad is that person or how calm is that person as a different way to visualize that data. You know, traditionally, you might just look at that value and say, you know, did Amazon think that this, you know, how confident was Amazon that this was actually true? But we found that we could use that value in other ways to um, provide insights to our clients. So now what we want to do is we want to put all of this together and we want to show this to you within the context of an actual Amazon ad. Some of you may have seen this before. This is the Amazon Super Bowl ad. Uh, we're going to play it through and we're going to show you how this all works together. Yeah, so before I start playing it, um, I'll kind of toggle between the various categories of labels that return so you can um, see them all as it plays through and I'll scroll around. About halfway through, I'm going to enable some people tracking so you can see how the video recognition service um, outlines people and tracks them or paths them across the screen. So when you see that, that's what's happening there. In Austin, it's 60 degrees with a... Alexa? Amazon's Alexa lost her voice this morning, causing a... Alexa wave lost her of voice. How is that even possible? We have the replacements ready. Just say the word. And you're sure this is going to work? Yeah. Alexa, show me a recipe for a grilled cheese sandwich. Pathetic. You're 32 years of age, and you don't know how to make a grilled cheese sandwich. Its name is the recipe, you <laughs> Alexa, how far is Mars? How far 
Mars, Mars? Well, how am I supposed to know? I've never been there. This guy want to go to Mars. <laughs> For what? <laughs> There's not even oxygen there. Lexus, set the mood. Now setting the mood. You're in the bush. And you're just so dirty. And you're so sweaty. Because it's hot in that bush. Lexus, rebush. Re reboot. Lexus, play some country music. Oh, I don't dance now. I make money move. No, no, Lexus, country music. Brandon? I'm afraid Brandon is a little tied up. But do let me know if there's anything I can help you with. Jessica? Good boy. Thanks, guys, but I'll take it from here. So as you see, there's tons of value in everything that happened in the ad, being able to frame by frame get every piece of that. Um, but there still may be one or two of you in this audience who are thinking, you know, that's something that if I spent enough time, I could do that myself, right? So the real value of this is that you're not just looking at any one asset, right? You're looking at hundreds or thousands of assets that you've run over the course of one year, three years, five years. Uh, and when you put all of those together, that's when you can start to answer those questions like, is a person always effective? Am I better off showing a hotel lobby or a beach or a pool? And how does that work differently with different audiences? Because the aggregation of all of these tags right, with the overlay of performance data and understanding this audience by audience is what takes assets from being measurable to being actionable. And so this is where we really combine those creative attributes with the performance data coming back from the social platforms. So. If you're watching as I filtered this data by audiences, you know that went out to our Redshift database and pulled in the millions of rows of data that we got back from Facebook for the ad campaigns that we ran across all the media that we had in our account from August 27th through um, yesterday. And as a user, you can now see what are the attributes within all the media that I've run that are helping to drive performance. And so we can look through for through by look at performance through a variety of different KPIs, whether we're interested in view through or click through rate. Um, and all of that data now becomes very quickly accessible to our clients so that they can take action to understand what within their media is actually helping to drive performance, not just what media is performing better. So with that, we want to transition back from the demo just to sort of talking about what we think uh, is ultimately, let's skip ahead to the impact of this. So when we see this is right, frame allows us to optimize every asset, to make every asset that goes in market better. Uh, and so at the end of the day, right, what this is really about is it's about effectiveness, efficiency, and ROI. So on just some back of the envelope math, by uh, implementing this as our way to do creative meta-analysis, we see that it saved about 22,500 hours of someone sitting in a room going frame by frame, coding all of these things up. It shortened our production time. So rather than when you have to recreate new assets, that laborious process of going in market and it taking a long time, it's shortened that by about 21 days per asset. And finally, effectiveness. At the end of the day, it's about how do you drive better ROA for your clients. So these optimized assets are not only quicker and more efficient, but they're also more effective in driving uh, engagement and impact. So we see on average about an 80% increase in ROI. And so at this point, we hope to make this traffic circle a little less confusing for our clients and our creators in our community. And we can make that happen by using Amazon's services to really extract the data to hopefully give a little bit more process to creating content on social platforms. And so if you find recognition interesting, you should definitely go out to Amazon's council and start uploading videos and images to see what you get back. If you're building your own applications, um, it's, a great, it's a great tool to have. If you're really interested um, in what we were talking about today and the problems we're solving and the technologies we're using with Amazon and um, at VidMob, please let us know if you're interested in working with us. We're hiring um, engineers and data scientists and people who are really interested in evolving creativity. 
So thank you very much for your time today. And please don't forget to fill out the survey in your mobile app. And if you have any questions for us, please uh, see us over here. We'll be around for the next 15 minutes or so to answer questions. Thanks a lot, everybody. Hopefully you all learned a little bit about how you can use the AI in a way you haven't used it yet. So um, please think about that. Uh, please fill out the survey. It's super important to me personally. So thank you. And uh, we'll be over here taking questions and whatnot. And uh, thank you for coming.